Good morning, everyone. I, I apologize. The handout you have has some errors. I've made corrections. So uh, it, the paper is for reference. And feel free to recycle it after the talk. Uh, the PowerPoint here has updated information. I had some uh, pre-2014 reconstructions and little things I changed. So it's something to refer to and scribble on and uh, whatever you feel like. But, uh, so, um, OK. So I'm, uh, as the title suggests here, I'm, I'm using, applying uh, the Baxter Cigar Old Chinese Reconstructions uh, as a point of reference. Uh, and it is useful to me uh, because it has a lot of reference to the etic, uh, which is uh, uh, my interest. Um, uh, my question is, uh, how do I know sometimes whether these are actually uh, old Chinese or maybe some other period loans? Because there's, no, there's always a degree of certainty, and it's never 100%. Uh, so, uh, and I'm also interested in the timing of these things, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. So I'll talk about the role of old Chinese in reconstructing uh, early Vietic culture uh, and its change after Sinaitic influence. That's what I've been increasingly interested in. I suppose the best term for what I am doing is ethno-historical linguistics, linguistic ethno-history. I don't really know what to call it. It's not philology, so it's something a little different. Maybe someone has a better term. Regardless of the term, I'm taking an interdisciplinary approach, and I'm exploring human sociocultural history by using linguistic evidence, and I'm looking at the linguistic evidence in light of the sociocultural history, so it's a blend. Uh, for example, I'll use semantic domain analysis uh, to talk about some of the cultural aspects. So it involves a mixture of data and analytical approaches within disciplines where people disagree on things. So it's necessarily a matter of weight of evidence, I suppose, because each of the disciplines have their own kind of theoretical approaches. Okay, so I'm going to start with a couple of quotes. So how do you connect uh, historical sociolinguistics uh, and uh, maybe ethno-archaeology. Uh, so I'm going to give you a couple of quotes here. Uh, this is Audre Cour, the translation here by uh, Guillaume, actually, a soon-to-be-published, I guess, translation of the uh, collection of Audre Cour's work. And so that bold print there, under the cultural influence of Chinese, as attested by loanwords. Nice, simple sentence. It just requires books and books of writing to explain and clarify, right? And so on the uh, other side, or not the other side, but on the other side is uh, uh, Hagem, Charles Hagem is a top Southeast Asian uh, archaeologist. The direct Chinese contact with Dhammasan people is the most likely means whereby knowledge of iron is reached. Uh, Bakbo is uh, Beibu, the kind of northern region that Vietnam is referring to. So, uh, now, this could potentially benefit from the linguistic side of things. He wasn't looking at the linguistic side of things. So let's consider a sample here of uh, lexical evidence. As you can see there, these terms for metals here and in the various language groups. And uh, pretty evident that metallurgy in southern China and northern Vietnam is, you know, starts at a very early period. That's what it would appear. Uh, so focusing on the Vietnamese and Vietic forms there, uh, gang there for steel, that's pretty clearly related. Uh, uh, these, however, are a little more problematic. And uh, you see there the proto uh, Dai and Hmong Mian form match reasonably well. I don't know quite what to do with this. And yet, it seems pretty clear that this is not just chance similarities. It's pretty strong evidence from the archaeological side that Iron Age emerges with the arrival of the Chinese. So, uh, so this is the kind of question I have in mind, where there's uncertainty because these are sporadic borrowings and that sort of thing. Okay. So the kind of uh, points of inquiry are uh, considering uh, what Vietic was like before uh, and in the immediate centuries uh, after the contact, the kind of convergence period in those first few centuries, and not just Vietic, of course. Um, and I'm interested, as much as I can find, refinement and periodization of the lexical borrowing. And so uh, you obviously have to have extra linguistic data to be able to do that sort of thing. Uh, and along the way, when you're looking at all of these, you have to consider the strengths and weaknesses of each of the disciplines and, of course, what any one human being can do with taking on you know, multiple disciplines at the same time. But anyways, to provide sufficient weight of evidence, uh, that's basically the way to do it with uh, this point. Okay, so uh, to talk a little bit of uh, considering uh, the sociocultural aspect. Uh, we can consider modern Vietic cultural, socio-cultural structures. So uh, 
what I mean, for example, here, uh, a, state, a state level, Vietnamese is considered at the state level, that's this is today, okay? But just to consider this as a model for the past. Uh, the moon groups, which are largely chieftains, less synthesized, but very much, oh, oh, I forgot to put that red button there. Pretty much Vietnamese and Moon are in that sinosphere, so I in the sinosphere, complex tone systems, monosyllabic. Whereas these other, oops, I've got to get used to this, uh, the Bong Chuk groups, other Vietic languages are uh, more or less in that category of Mon Khmer typology and the pre syllables, but they have some tones or register. It's uh, very conservative, but if you see the languages described, they are recognizably Mon Khmer. In, in structure. So this sort of language and society, there is some correspondence. And so we're, that's the way to consider what the origins of Vietic culture are in this region here. This is that so-called Bakbo region. There is Bakbo. And uh, the Dam San culture, if you've heard the term, is centered in northern Vietnam there and uh, in the Red River Delta region. Um, Gola is the center there. Gola is a state level society uh, that's more recent in the literature at this point that it's been established at state level. Um, so Dam San culture is generally considered to be the source of Vietnamese culture and if so we can assume that it constitutes a proto-Vietic speech community and Vietic therefore means that I'm not taking any particular position on any language or it's a group of languages, I, we don't have that much information. Uh, with this emergence of the, uh, again, Gola uh, state uh, by 200 BC, but certainly was surrounded by chiefdoms and tribes, those different levels of society. So it may have reached state level here, but of course there would have been a variety of socio-political units outside. So uh, we must assume, however, that the whole region uh, was a mon khmer type Austro-Asiatic language again. So this is what we are. So different from today, this is the pre-synthesization period. Okay? So that's the assumption of what I, I take to be this general circumstances for this synetic Vietic uh, uh, contact at that period. Okay. Uh, so the lexical data, back to the lexical data. Um, so as Audrey Court claimed, uh, the lexical evidence shows Chinese cultural influence. Uh, this influence led to massive linguistic restructuring throughout the synosphere. Okay, fine. Uh, we don't focus on the literary sign of Vietnamese. Uh, generally, when people say sign of Vietnamese, that's what they mean. They mean this sort of literary level. I'll use the shorthand LSV for literary sign of Vietnamese or late sign of Vietnamese in contrast with early sign of Vietnamese. So those are the terms I'll use. And there's very formalized, high phonological consistency, absolute certainty. I can check it in a dictionary, and I know it's sign of Vietnamese. So. Uh, early sign of Vietnamese, ESV, rather than OSV. For a while, I used OSV. Uh, we focus on that. Uh, this is largely from spoken transmission. Uh, we expect some mixed uh, consistency in the phonological forms, as I provided an example of at the beginning. Uh, and degree of high to low certainty, and just sometimes you can't know, really. And uh, we keep them, I keep them in the list, and just label them low certainty, medium certainty, high certainty. It's very rare that I label a, an old Chinese form complete certainty, even though in my mind I'm certain. <laughs> Okay, so we need uh, some extra linguistic evidence to deal with the inconsistencies, right? Okay, historical and archeological evidence. Okay, so what are the kinds of evidence? Uh, comparative, uh, so the kinds of data are expected. Uh, comparative linguistic data, as I've shown in those uh, instances of words for metals. Uh, historical documents, and I'll provide a couple of brief examples of that, the Chinese historical documents. Uh, of course, the archeological data, we've got approximate dates of material objects. <laughs> As far as associated actions and cultural concepts, we can only make inferences about those things, right? So we, we have the data. There's no intangible uh, items are, of course, harder to deal with. But certainly for ethno-historical purposes, uh, you, you keep the inferences uh, in mind. So let's turn to examples of each type. OK. Uh, in comparative evidence, we, we want phonological patterns, and of course the, uh, I think it's of course, the strongest indicator are the types of this, uh, I'm, I'm going to call it shorthand, uh, Shang-Chu reversal. It's not really a reversal, in a sense it's a reversal. So in that early period, 
of or the late period, we find uh, Shang and Chu, and in that early period, these are re the reverse of them. So there's my early sign of Vietnamese, that little curved tone there means that's the Shang uh, category. That uh, sock tone means it's a Chu category, but in these it's the opposite. So that's, that's uh, pretty robust and consistent with the idea that uh, there were no tones, final glottal stop, final fricatives. And so those are, are pretty strong linguistic indicators. Okay. Uh, sometimes we have words which don't have so much information. So back at the gang steel indication, the ping shung doesn't tell me much uh, necessarily uh, because, of course, it's uh, non, dis non distinctive in a sense, uh, as well as ru shung, not, not very distinctive. But the uh, initials here, as was, I guess it was discussed yesterday, some that kind of uh, uh, lenition at the initials, the G is more like G, that's a, a velar uh, fricative. Those sorts of things occur. Uh, also, vowels uh, tend to be uh, uh, a little bit of diphthongization, and those are generally useful indicators of the time depth. Uh, an odd one is uh, the level tones from Chu Shang. So that kind of goes counter to this category up here, but I keep finding more of these, and so we find this Ping Shang level tone, there's no tone on there for what are uh, evidently. Uh, Chu Sheng final fricatives. And so it's odd because here the speakers recognize it. Here something else is happening. And so that, that's an interesting question to consider. Okay. Something uh, Baxter and Cigar have noted. Okay. Okay, the phonological categories uh, of old Chinese loans and early Sino Vietnamese are corroborated by old Chinese loans of Koda Dai, Hmong uh, Mian. Uh, as well as the other. And uh, so the bit of comparative evidence, so when I find these kinds of things, okay, good. And I find tonal correspondences, good. So it's uh, beyond Vietic looking at the others and going, oh, okay, well, they match too. Uh, even some things like the uh, particular vowel that bearded you is uh, ooh, the back on around the vowel, as in the uh, proto die form. And I've noticed a few instances of that. <coughs> Uh, the, oh, uh, you see the sources there. Uh, Vietta is actually the show for this, is in, and I don't know if I'm supposed to cite his stuff or not. But it's on Mont Khmer and Washington Dictionary, so it should be okay to cite it. Okay, okay. so the uh, comparative evidence is useful in, in, in establishing some of the words as Old Chinese or not. Uh, well, Old Chinese, or at least in the early period, uh, not necessarily Old Chinese, and that's, uh, that's a, no, no, another question that I'll get to at the end. Talk here. Okay, let's get a sample historical rest, uh, record. And you don't have to read the whole thing, but this uh, text referring from the fifth century back to the first century in that region of northern Vietnam, there, that's the political administration there. And I identify the words just for just for fun, essentially. I'm not claiming that these words are old, old Chinese words just because they're in this text exactly, but that it is a historical documentation that these concepts were introduced into the region. Now I'm gonna give the caveats after I say that, of course. Okay, so essentially saying Xi Wang brought all of those things to Northern Vietnam. Well, that's a very bold statement. Uh, so I've picked out some of these words. So this is evidence of the possibility that these words were introduced in this approximate period. That's all. Not, no strong claims, but it is evidence that one should not ignore and throw away. <laughs> okay, but of course there are problems in identifying uh, early sign of Vietnamese through these historical documents, right? So historians know such texts are fraught with uncertainties. And the Ho Han Shu excerpt is referring to something centuries before. It's largely taken from and written as a court document to an emperor. So in addition to its usual uh, literary Chinese conciseness, which doesn't give much information, it's compounded by bias. And so we cannot take it at face value. Uh, there are reconstructable forms for uh, these kinds of things in Austroasiatic, uh, so in Proto-Austroasiatic for some of these things. So, uh, in, in addition, uh, 
the dumb scene culture had already, already reached a state level society and they had wet rag, red rice agriculture for some centuries before. So what, what does this mean when the document says Xi Guang introduced these things? Well, certainly there were some administrative pushes to do certain things. Uh, so, you know, we have to take the evidence uh, skeptically, but it's certainly uh, useful to consider as a source of uh, extra-linguistic uh, data. Okay, let's see. So a couple of other historical examples. Uh, uh, well here, you can see they're just brief information. I have not come across wells in the archaeological literature in the Bakbo region. There are, there are some for Chinese that, that, that go well, you know, or early Han, Western Han of, um, I've forgotten the term now, but to replicas of wells that are buried with people in tombs and that sort of thing. So it's well established tradition. But there's historical evidence of the Nguangmong's region in that first period uh, borrowing this, and then we have the correspondence of the tones. So it, it brings in a little bit of extra linguistic evidence that suggests, oh, indeed, yes, it was mandated in the region uh, at that time, at that approximate time. Uh, hat, uh, part of the clothing in that uh, previous sample, uh, this excerpt, uh, I'm not sure what to make of the timing of the loss of the final K and that sort of thing. But certainly it was, uh, they used a different word in the historical text. It was guan, you know, something like a helmet or something like that, but approximately that term for hat, head, headwear. And finally, some censuses from that same period uh, suggest if you're taking censuses and you are uh, collecting taxes, household uh, administration becomes common. And what I don't quite know is I expect the, the tone, the, the Shangtu reversal, and it's not there, and I, I don't quite know what to make of it. The old Chinese reconstruction is this, but it has a si so I thought it would be chu sheng, but I, I don't know enough maybe about that. So I'm not sure what to make of this in terms of the timing. I need some more clarification there. Okay, now uh, archaeological uh, data. We've covered comparative, uh, historical, archaeological data. Uh, there are numerous caveats that one must keep in mind. They are very proximate times. There are disagreements among the researchers, such as when the Bronze Age began in Southeast Asia, things like that. And, uh, there's uncertainty in the timing of loan words. They, loan words could have come in at that time. They could have come in much later. I have no way to confirm any of that, right? So regarding the archaeological evidence, you have to put out the caveats up front. Okay. Uh, we can infer cultural practices and concepts, but they're never non-disprovable. I can never not prove or disprove absolutely, for example, that marriage was or was not introduced at that time. A lot of it is inferential, okay? Uh, having said that, we can still use some of the data uh, and, uh, and useful. Oh yes, and of course, there are gaps in the data. There's gaps in the archeological data. There are gaps in the uh, lexical data. That's, that's the way it is. And so we deal with whatever data we're able to find. Okay, uh, so uh, first example is the word for sword, which appears in the Bakbo region, very late BC period. Uh, uh, bronze knives and axes were part of the Damsan culture several centuries prior. So it's, it's not that they, the Chinese did not bring in the Bronze Age. That, that's several centuries uh, before. The Iron Age, not the Bronze Age, okay. But uh, swords specifically are considered to be mm, largely innovations from the North. Uh, there is also support of this for this uh, uh, ping chung for chu chung category word. So we've got a combination of historical, archaeological, and linguistic data to, to strengthen that as a pre uh, millennial, a pre uh, turn of the millennium time. Uh, polished mirrors are very common in the Han style tombs in northern Vietnam. I found no mention of mirrors in mainland Southeast Asian archaeology prior to this period. Unlike, for example, the, the bronze drums, if you're familiar with those, yeah, that's you know, well studied. The mirrors, not so much. So, as far as I can tell, this is something that arrives with uh, Chinese. Uh, so, the archaeological evidence is not as early as swords, a little bit later. Again, that, that first century. Uh, BCE is where a lot of this seems to have uh, happened. A lot of the archaeological evidence really focuses on that first century BCE. There are things before, but there's something really did happen at that time. Okay, even uh, glass bowls 
uh, in that region, again, to that first century BCE. Okay. Oh, and we've got our expected uh, tone. Oh, yes, we've got our uh, final vowel stop versus final fricative type tone there as expected. So. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to go quickly through this one because this one can take a while. Tile. Uh, interesting because of the final off lie. Uh, no, as far as I can tell, no modern variety of Chinese has it. It's all ah. Uh, Hmong Mian Dai, ah. Uh, Vietnamese final off line, I. Uh, apparently, uh, I guess, uh, cigar, but I guess it would have been Bill Baxter who first noted it in the odes, I guess, and I've forgotten which, when it was mentioned exactly. Uh, rhymes in the odes, okay, so that's the only evidence. Rhymes in the odes. <laughs> So that's good, that's linguistic evidence. Uh, archaeological evidence, a recent study, thousands of ceramic roof styles dating to this earlier period. This is much earlier. This is not the first century uh, CE, first century, or really second century uh, BCE. Uh, large numbers of tiles, they don't appear elsewhere. It's all in this concentrated period at the Kola site that I mentioned before. Okay. Uh, context of increasing um, uh, 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 political status and legitimacy in this emerging state. Fine. Uh, no, no Chinese characters on the tiles, though. But it's evidently a Chinese style, so modeling of them. Okay. So uh, I can hypothesize, and hypothesize means one can argue against it. Of course, that it increases the likelihood that Moy is a, a synonymic borrowing, and that the borrowing may have come as early as really around 200 BCE, and if so, that really is, as far as I can tell, the earliest uh, evidential uh, evidence of an old Chinese loan. Uh, I haven't found anything, uh, for example, in the Warring States period. This is West Han, essentially. It's the very beginning of West Han. Uh, the takeaway here is that the, uh, the takeaway here is that the combination of this increases the certainty of it. So we have the odes, we have archaeological evidence. Okay. So uh, now, talking about semantic domains. So I'm going to go over a couple of if categories of semantic domains here. Uh, so I've shown instances of semantic impact on early Edictic culture uh, via historical and archaeological data. <coughs> so let's use the lexical stuff to uh, do a little semantic domain analysis. Normally, semantic domain analysis is done with living speakers. So uh, I'm using, again, data that's incomplete, uncertain. Uh, but uh, certainly we can see that relative age and gender was impacted, that uh, that's the younger is native, uh, older uh, is Chinese, and from a very early period, evidently, okay? Uh, we have this paternal versus maternal becoming stronger uh, through the lexical evidence of old Chinese suggesting uh, social cultural impact there, okay? Uh, the difference between the paternal and maternal sides uh, in those terms. Now, later Middle Chinese words were added to uh, supplement it, but these apparently, based on the, the tone, we've got our expected uh, Shantu reversal here. Uh, these do appear to be in that general period. So my, well, my guess would be either the first century CE or the, the 300s, fourth century CE, when another group arrived. And that, to me, is a question of the timing. And this has had an impact on the overall uh, uh, system of address and pronouns. I mean, it's had, it had a very profound impact on the, the terms of, of address and Vietnamese and pronouns. Uh, of course, you, you know, you're introducing marriage as we talk, those family structures is related to that period. So was it the 100s AD? Was it the 300s? I don't know when there were more that came in the 300s. But an overall restructuring of the system. So that's, what, that's an example of what I can do. Now, obviously, this is very cursory. But the idea that what was Austroasiatic system before, and we would have to model what happens in other Mon Khmer type groups uh, to see what uh, it could have been, okay, what kinds of changes. But the complete, virtually lost, I mean, pronouns in, in Vietnamese are virtually taboo, inappropriate to use among friends. I'm sorry, only with friends, inappropriate to use in polite situations. Okay. Um, 
Uh, beyond marriage and family structure, uh, what about trade systems? Uh, certainly there was a state level society at the Kolaw site. Uh, we see a number, but we see a number of Chinese, old Chinese terms, or maybe somewhat later terms uh, from this period. Um, and while, uh, while bronze was an important part of the Dom Sun culture, bronze had long been used there, silver, gold, uh, and coins in the archaeological literature uh, are only in the archaeological record after the establishment of Chinese administration. Uh, so in uh, Sino-Vietnamese, early Sino-Vietnamese, we had this full range of market economy materials and concepts. So again, this is cursory, but it suggests a significant impact on the trade system and probably the development of a complex uh, economic system. What it was before, I don't have enough information. <laughs> okay, a related issue was just general material culture. Uh, so uh, clothing was already mentioned as being mandated by Xi Guang. Uh, so we have those kinds of words, and there's some more. Uh, uh, home furnishings, uh, again, what was common in Vietic culture prior to the Han arrival is less certain, uh, but at least for now, when we combine a marriage, family, economy, and household, we have a fairly complete package, cultural package, uh, Chinese-style cultural package uh, from this. Okay. Uh, to top it off, I'll just, I'm not even going to talk about it, right? Just, of course, writing, literacy, uh, abstract concepts of time, calendars, uh, really quite a, a rich range of uh, something that we can see. So I've, I've got over, I don't know, 300, 350 early sign of Vietnamese terms that I consider in the high certainty category, another hundred of reduced certainty. There's enough evidence to do some tentative hypothesizing. Uh, so to summarize the, the kind of changes here, uh, 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 kind of this historical ethno-semantics, really, that's what I've been doing. Uh, a number of domains have been introduced and, uh -oh. uh, probably just disappear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was the two-minute warning. <laughs> get ready, presenters, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I don't want, I want to be careful not to assume that Vedic peoples did not have some of these practices and some of these materials. It's, it's sensitive, and if I'm talking to Vietnamese scholars, I want to be very careful. And indeed, just for scientific validity, I have to be careful. There, there's plenty of evidence of a fairly advanced, complex sociocultural, sociopolitical structure uh, in the region. Uh, uh, images on the Dam Sun uh, bronzes, uh, the bronze drums and stuff, so wealthy leaders wearing different kinds of headwear. Wearing headwear, it wasn't as though he hats were introduced, but perhaps just Chinese style hats, Chinese style accoutrements and such, okay. But it does appear that a complex economy uh, was introduced. Uh, it obviously had a complex, a significant impact on the uh, family system, marriage practices and that sort of thing, okay. It's also important to notice where things did not have impact. And just to remind, just to highlight that, no numbers borrowed. Vietnamese has its own number is good for them, right? Not like some other groups. Uh, so there is a lot of contact, and yet, conversely, not a lot of grammatical vocabulary from that period. Whereas I presented not long ago on sinodigrammatical vocabulary, quite a rich array of grammatical vocabulary compared to Vietnamese. So, you know, putting this into perspective, I still say light to moderate structural influence, but I don't know. Maybe it's upped a little bit by the sociocultural changes. And on the, the last page there, 26 there, oh sorry, well, for you, the panel 26, some of these transitional forms, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what to do with these. I, I suspect that this is, uh, uh, see the tones, they don't flip. This is totally different category. Uh, I don't know how to evaluate these yet. Are these due to uh, different varieties of synetic? Did they come at a later period after tones had emerged? Uh, some lingering questions. But if I'm going to time these kinds of things, provide approximate dates, I need the extra linguistic 
data to be able to do that. Uh, so, oh, and for example, the uh, 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 things related to potentially to Buddhism, that's clearly in the early centuries, not in the Han Dynasty, that, that such, a, uh, uh, such terms would be borrowed. So I'm finished, I can answer questions, and if uh, you don't have questions now, I can certainly talk to people later. And obviously I have uh, lots of things that are challenging and uh, hypotheses that can be challenged. So, but I certainly would appreciate any questions or comments or help uh, with figuring things out. Thank you.